Having to spend your nights awake and your days asleep is not made for everyone. This hasn't been a problem for me as a kid since I never managed to fall asleep at night and ended up sleeping during class. I lost count of how many times I woke up to my teacher shouting my name and my classmates staring at me. When I turned 16, I had to start thinking about what career I wanted to pursue. Because I usually am wide awake at night, I figured I could become a security guard who works the night shift. I look intimidating as I am tall and often go to the gym, so my sole appearance would tell people not to try and mess with me. Although in fact, I'm not as tough and strong as I look. That being said, it appears my experience in the field has led me to quite a unique job opportunity. My boss approached me and asked if I was interested in guarding a hospital for three days. He mentioned the job would pay exceptionally well compared to my previous jobs, as it requires experience and a trustworthy person. The opportunity of working in a hospital has not yet been offered to me during my time working here, and it seemed like quite the challenge. If I managed to fulfill the job as expected, it might also result in a salary increase. I accepted the offer wholeheartedly, as declining would be foolish. I remember my boss looking relieved upon hearing my response. Supposedly, he struggled to find any other security guards willing to take on the job. You will start next week on Thursday. Make sure to be there before 10 p.m., he said, shaking my hand. I shook his hand with a huge smile on my face, aesthetic to get started. You bet, sir. In the days leading up to the assignment, I guarded a few uneventful shifts at various places, such as a university and a McDonald's. I was happy, however, when the day of the unique opportunity arrived. Not wanting to be late, I drove to the hospital around 8 p.m. It's only a 30-minute ride, but you never know what might happen. I also figured getting to know the place wasn't such a bad idea. I mean, how am I supposed to guard a building I don't know the layout of? I didn't want to screw this up as it pays me three times what I usually make. It was surprisingly busy on the road, which led me to arrive at the hospital around 8.40 p.m. I got out of my car and made my way to the front door. The building seemed medieval as it was made from bricks and had this Romanesque charm. The building wasn't big, in fact it's rather small. From the outside it seemed the building has three floors with short hallways. I pushed the front door open and greeted the lady at the counter. Her smile radiated a welcoming, soothing feeling, easing me of any nerves in an instant. Hello, I believe I was hired for the night shift at this hospital. I'm a bit early though, I was supposed to start at 10 p.m. What's your name, darling? She asked, maintaining her inviting smile. I'm Jake, I replied confidently. She started typing on the PC in front of her, seemingly checking whether I was speaking the truth. I mean, you never can be too sure. Some crazy people would pretend to be a night shift security guard. Is your boss Michael? Yes, ma'am. All right, one of the other security guards will be here shortly to explain the procedures. Would you like a cup of coffee in the meantime? I would love a cup of coffee. Could it be black? I asked with a grateful face. She chuckled and left to get me my coffee. A few minutes later, she returned with a cup of coffee. It tasted amazing, unlike anything I've tasted before. Everything seemed to fall right in line because a security guard approached me right as I finished my coffee. The security guard looked at me with skeptical eyes, judging my appearance before saying, You must be the security guard, huh? I didn't expect someone so young to show up for the job, but that doesn't matter if you do as I say. I got out of my chair and held out my hand to shake his hand. Nice to meet you, sir. I assume you will be showing me around? I asked confidently. I was always taught that it's important to look confident even though you might not feel confident, as it leaves a positive impression on the people you work for. However, the security guard in front of me, six feet seven and quite the physique, made it difficult for me to not feel intimidated. Follow me, he ordered. I followed him, and we made our way to the security room. 
He proceeded to show me how the cameras operate and gave me a tour around the building. He told me some basic security rules which I've heard too many times. Oh, there's one last thing, he mentioned as he was leaving. You see that paper on the desk? Read it. It contains a list of rules that you must follow. If you don't, we'll know. I hope you are professional enough to take them seriously and follow them, no matter how bizarre they might seem. I looked at him dumbfounded, but swiftly regained my composure and assured him I would follow the rules. Good luck, kid, he said as he left the room. I watched him leave as the clock positioned above the door told me that it was 9.30 p.m., which meant I had 30 more minutes before my shift officially started. The paper stated a total of seven rules. Rule one, your shift will begin at 10 p.m. Make sure that you are inside the security room by that time. From 10.15 p.m. until 11 p.m., you are required to patrol the building to ensure that no individuals are present. If you encounter anyone, kindly ask them to leave. Rule two, somewhere between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m., a young woman could appear knocking on the front door and asking to see her husband. Ignore her completely and pretend she isn't there until she goes away. Rule three, ensure that the lights inside the intensive care unit remain on throughout your shift. If they happen to turn off, make your way over there and turn them back on. If you hear screaming while the lights are off, run towards the nearest bathroom and stay there until the screaming stops, then proceed to turn the lights on. Rule four, if there's a little girl with a teddy bear in the cafeteria, sit next to her and don't say a word. If she looks at you, walk back to the security room. If she speaks to you, talk back until she leaves. Rule five, around 1 a.m., go to the general ward and check on the patients. If one seems to be sitting on their bed, ask them if they're okay and do whatever they request. If they strike up a conversation besides this, ignore it. Rule six, if it starts raining, open the front door and let people in for shelter. Make sure everyone you let inside leaves the building. If someone seems to be missing, you will see them on the security cameras. Do not look at them. Rule seven, if the security cameras were to turn off any time throughout the night, hide and pray for your life. They won't find you. I put the paper back down on the desk and leaned back in the chair. I laughed at the sheer bizarreness of the situation. I must be getting pranked. I thought to myself, though deep down, I did not believe it was a prank. This was in fact a hospital, and it seemed unlikely my boss would go to such lengths for a joke. Perhaps this was his way of seeing how much he could trust me, to see if I would follow such foolish rules. I reread the rules once again to make sure I understood them. I sure as hell was going to show my boss that he can count on me. The clock struck 10 p.m., and I turned my attention to the security cameras. With not much happening on the security cameras and only having 15 minutes until I was supposed to patrol, I felt my attention slowly falling towards my phone, the best way to waste your time. Spending time looking at memes and stupid internet news sure does go by quickly. It felt like I barely had spent time on my phone, yet it was already 10.15 p.m., I left my cozy chair, stretched my legs, and made my way out of the security room. I figured that starting at the highest floor and descending my way down would be the best course of action, so I made my way to the highest floor. Thankfully, there was an elevator, so I did not have to bother using the stairs. I made my way up the highest floor and started checking all the rooms, hallways, and even the bathrooms. As I expected, nothing special happened. The thing about working the night shift as a security guard is mostly that someone must be at the location in case something happens. However, this does not mean anything will happen, making it a boring, easy way to earn money. On top of that, I get to grab coffee and snacks whenever I want. No one seemed to be on the third floor, so I decided to descend to the second floor of the building. After patrolling the second floor, I reached the conclusion I had set for myself beforehand. Nothing special. I grabbed my phone to check the time and see if I needed to hurry. It was 10.32 p.m. when I finished the second floor 
giving me enough time to explore the first floor. It did strike me as weird, however, that there was literally no one in the hospital. I expected a hospital to always have doctors and patients in the building, as that's the entire point of a hospital. However, every room I checked so far has been empty. If my boss was indeed trying to test me, he did not go all in on the preparations. Despite that, I proceeded to the first floor, which contained the intensive care unit, security room, front door, and cafeteria. I planned to pass through the ICU and main hall area first, so I could finish off with the cafeteria and get myself a snack. As I made my way through the ICU, I was caught by surprise when I noticed an old man, around 70 years old, standing in one of the rooms. Wonderstruck for a bit, I recalled rule number one. If you encounter anyone, kindly ask them to leave. Suddenly everything fell into place. I realized that my boss had likely hired an actor and allowed him inside the building to test my adherence to the rules. With a sigh, I made my way toward the man. Excuse me, sir, you are not supposed to be here at this time. I would like to kindly ask you to leave. I firmly asserted to the old man. The old man looked at me without saying a word, appearing confused by what I had told him. Sir, I would kindly like to ask you to leave. I repeated. He nodded his head in agreement and followed me out of the building. Have a good night, sir, I told him as he walked away. Right before he completely vanished into the darkness, the old man unexpectedly spoke. Be careful of the surgeon. What did he mean by that? I quickly realized my boss must have told him to say that to scare me, so I quickly disregarded it. I continued my patrol around the floor. No one else seemed to be on the first floor, so I grabbed another cup of coffee and a croissant from the cafeteria. As it was 10.53 p.m., I made my way back to the security room. Once inside, I leaned back in my chair and played some games on my phone, confident no one was in the building, and I had nothing to worry about. After playing games on my phone for a while, and finally checking the time, I was surprised to see it was nearly 12 a.m., I had spent over an hour playing games on my phone. I shifted my attention to the security cameras, scanning for any anomalies. My heart skipped a beat as I noticed the lights of the ICU were switched off. I cursed at myself for not paying attention as I had no idea how long the lights had been switched off and the rule stated to turn them on as soon as possible. I got out of the security room to turn on the lights. As I walked towards the ICU, I froze in my steps. The sound of people screaming was deafening. I was baffled by the situation, unsure if my boss would have gone this far just to see how far I would follow the rules. The agony in the screams was noticeable and raised my anxiety. That's when I heard a door open and close, followed by footsteps making their way towards my location. Without hesitation, I bolted to the bathroom on the first floor and locked myself in one of the toilets. I tried to gather my composure and make sense of the situation I found myself in. I couldn't seem to understand how it was possible for anyone to even be in the building. Their screams of agony felt so realistic that it left no room to think this was staged by my boss. Those screams were real. Before I could fully reclaim my composure, the bathroom door swung open and the same footsteps I heard before walked inside. I tried to stay as silent as possible, not knowing if the person had a weapon. For a second, the silence was deafening, until the person started whispering a song to himself. Welcome to the hospital. Welcome to the hospital. You can come, but you can't go. Welcome to the hospital. Welcome to the hospital. He murmured as he knocked on the doors of every bathroom stall. I jumped when he knocked on mine the sound was noticeably louder than with the others. Through the gap beneath the door, I could see his feet on the other side completely motionless. Is anyone there? He said it with a deranged tone. Open up. Don't be shy. He continued. My heart pounded in my chest as I held on to the silence. I remained frozen, praying he would soon leave me alone so I could get the hell out of here. 
The man persisted, knocking on the door in an attempt to gain any reaction out of me. Come on, Jake, I need your help with something. He cried out desperately. I felt my blood turn cold at the sound of him mentioning my name, unsure as to how he could have known it. I stayed still and did not make a sound. After a couple of minutes, he gave up and walked out of the bathroom. Right before he left, one more sentence left his mouth. See you soon, Jake. I did not leave the bathroom for another ten minutes until the screaming had finally stopped. I unlocked the bathroom stall I was in and slowly opened the door that led towards the main hall, making sure no one was in sight. I exited the bathroom and slowly made my way to the ICU to turn the lights back on. Right after I turned the lights on, I ran towards the security room, as it suddenly felt like the only safe place in the building. As I let myself fall into the cozy chair, I looked at the time displayed on my phone, which indicated 12.51 a.m. Still full of adrenaline from what had just happened, I quickly reread all the rules to see if I had acted the way I was supposed to. Thankfully, that was the case. As I got to Rule 5, I was given a lovely reminder to check up on the patients around 1 a.m. and fulfill any wishes they had. Though I was not too sure if I was ready for another endeavor, I was more afraid of what might happen if I didn't abide by the rules. Despite, during my patrol I did not see anyone in the patient rooms, so how could there be anyone? I made my way up the stairs, this time reluctant to use the elevator, feeling like it might stop working. Besides, it's only one floor, so I might as well use the stairs. As I stepped on the second floor, my heartbeat started increasing slightly, as I did not know to expect. As I made my way to the patients, I started to hear excessive coughing from one of the rooms. I decided to go past the rooms one by one to make sure I did not skip any of them. As I peered into the first room, hoping to see nothing except an empty room, I was disappointed. In the bed lay an old woman, apparently sleeping. She had two tubes inside her nostrils and a needle in her arm. This is when I realized I hate the sight of people in these conditions. In every room were patients who seemed either extremely sick or extremely wounded. While making my way throughout the hallway, the coughing sound became louder as I slowly made my way towards the source. Of course, it was in the last room. In case it was that maniac in the bathroom from before, I'd have to run the farthest. All the other patients were sleeping. As I made my way to the last and final room, I took a deep breath before walking in. Despite my nervousness, I stepped into the doorway and looked at the man. The man was sitting on the bed, elbow in front of his mouth and coughing like he had been the past few minutes. When he noticed me, he tried to speak. Water. He muttered, trying to stop his coughing. For a second, I was caught off guard. This guy seemed to be an actual patient. I even felt pity for him. I couldn't imagine what it'd be like for him. I quickly ran down to the cafeteria to grab a cup of water and bring it to him. As he saw me standing in the doorway, his hand signaled me to come closer and hand him the cup of water. I walked towards him and handed it to him. He drank it so fast I figured he had beaten a world record. He collapsed on his bed and thankfully stopped coughing. Thank you. He exclaimed. No problem, man. You seemed like you needed it, I replied. After a minute of sitting in the silence with the man, I figured it was time for me to leave the room as I did what he asked. Besides, he didn't seem to be much of a chatter. He was just happy to have had his water. As I made my way to the door and wanted to grab the handle, he spoke. Where are you going? Come sit with me, my friend. A chill went down my spine as I heard him speak. His entire tone changed from before and he sounded serious. I slowly turned my head back to him, realizing I had no choice but to do what he asked. I sat down next to him on the bed. What's up? I tried to say confidently but failed in doing so. I'm not going to hurt you, son. I appreciate you helping me. You see, the surgeon stuffed a can of cinnamon down my throat which left me unable to breathe. 
I wanted to tell you to be careful because he's still wandering the building. He stuffed cinnamon down your throat? I asked in disbelief. That's when I remembered what the old man from before had said. Be careful of the surgeon. Yes, he did. I wanted to warn you. This seems to be your first time here. I figured you'd like to know there's a maniac inside the building. If you do what the rules say, kid, you'll be fine. I looked at him with fright. After taking a deep breath and standing up, I thanked him and made my way out of the room. Thankfully, he did not ask me to come back. I made my way to the security room. My pace increased when I heard something falling on the third floor. In no multiverse would I have gone upstairs to check what was going on there. If I follow the rules, I'd be fine. I grabbed the door handle of the security room and closed it as soon as I was inside. A wave of relief crashed over me as I once again felt safe. When I looked at the clock above the door, it indicated the time was 1.53 a.m. I sat down in the chair and once again read the sheet of paper. Thankfully, there were no more rules stating me to go outside the security room. I prayed to God that the rest of the night would be as boring as all my previous jobs had been. I felt relieved knowing my shift ended at 6 a.m., which meant I only had four hours left to go. I could tell the events that occurred this eventful night had taken a toll on my energy, as I felt quite exhausted. While staring at the security cameras, I felt my eyelids slowly closing and my mind drifting away. I fell asleep in the chair, completely forgetting about where I even was to begin with. I woke up around 2.45 a.m. and gave my body and mind some time to adjust to reality, as I had no clue where I was when I woke up. After a short while I came back to my senses when I realized I was in the middle of a night shift. Awake, though still feeling the effects of waking up, I made my way to the cafeteria to grab myself a cup of coffee. I figured it had helped me stay awake for the rest of the night. I walked into the empty cafeteria and made my way to the coffee machine. I watched the coffee pour into my cup, entertained by the sight of it. As I turned around to go back to the security room, I jumped and spilled the coffee all over my suit. Although no one was in the cafeteria when I walked in, there was now a little girl sitting at one of the tables. Unsure of what the rules exactly said about this occurrence, I tried my best to remember the rules. My train of thought was interrupted once I noticed the little girl had turned around and was now staring at me. She had a small white skirt and a pink t-shirt and blonde curly hair going just as far as her shoulders. In her hand she held a teddy bear with buttons as eyes, except one of the eyes was hanging on by a thread. She looked at me without any expression on her face, making me feel uncomfortable and uncertain as to what I should do. All I could remember from the rules is that I had to sit next to her. Though I was reluctant and not entirely sure, I felt like it was the safest course of action. In the end, it was only a little girl. I sat next to her, her eyes intently staring at mine. She did not say a word for a long time, and I felt extremely uncomfortable, unsure of when I could leave. That is when she started giggling, covering her mouth with one hand while still holding her teddy bear with the other. You forgot the rules. She said it in a frightening and teasing tone. I looked at her confused, thinking I had remembered them correctly. She could see the panicked look in my eyes, enjoying the sight of it. Want to play hide and seek? She excitedly asked. I'll count to 60, and then we will look for you. I did not bother to ask who we was. She looked at me like a kid looks at candy in a candy store. I ran to the security room, leaving my coffee next to the little girl. As I ran away, I could hear her counting. One, two, three. Forever with me you'll be. Four, five, six. In the darkness, you'll cease to exist. I locked myself in the security room and quickly grabbed the rules as I reread Rule 4. If there's a little girl with a teddy bear in the cafeteria, sit next to her and don't say a word. If she looks at you, walk back to the security room. If she speaks to you, talk back until she leaves. 
My throat turned dry as I realized my mistake. As I realized I had broken one of the rules, I remembered her mentioning hide and seek. That's when suddenly all the security cameras turned off. Rule 7. If the security cameras were to turn off any time throughout the night, hide and pray for your life. They won't find you. I completely lost it, as I did not know what to expect nor where to hide. All I knew was that the security room was too obvious for me to stay in, as there's no way I could escape from here. Overtaken by adrenaline, it felt like my body was moving on its own. I reached for the front door and frantically tried to open it. The door didn't budge no matter how hard I kicked. 52, 53, 54, 55, prepare to run for your life. The little girl sang from inside the cafeteria. Despite feeling mentally overwhelmed, making me feel dizzy and close to passing out, my body had gotten a mind of its own. I ran up the stairs to the second floor, to the room of the patient to whom I had given a cup of water. I opened the door to his room, only to see he was no longer there. That did not matter to me at that point, however, as I just wanted to find a proper hiding spot. By the time I was inside the room, I could already hear the little girl frantically laughing and singing as she had counted to 60. Unsure of how long I had left before she would be coming to this room, I decided I had to hide as soon as possible. I looked around the room for any suitable hiding spots, but there seemed to be none. The best option I seemed to have was to get inside the ceiling, as it was made from plates that could be pushed up. I stood on the bed to get closer to the ceiling and hopefully pull myself up. I accidentally kicked the photo from the nightstand next to the bed. The sound of it hitting the ground echoed throughout the entire building. I heard that! She screamed as I heard her running towards my location. Completely freaked out and realizing I had to be quick, I jumped as high as I could and held onto the ceiling, pulling myself up as fast as I could. I could tell the ceiling wasn't made for any person being on top of it, as every little move I made caused the ceiling to cave. Once I made it up above the ceiling, I blocked off the square hole and laid completely still, not wanting to make a sound or have the chance of the ceiling falling. I could hear the little girl enter the room excitedly, tiptoeing around. I know you are in here. I heard you drop something. She said it in a playful tone, enjoying every second of it. My heartbeat skyrocketed throughout the entirety of the situation, unsure whether she would find me or not. She poked into the ceiling with a broom, trying to figure out if I was there or not. Though I almost jumped once I felt the vibrations of the broom touching the ceiling, I managed to lay still and not make a sound. I guess you're not here then. She said disappointingly as she walked out of the room and continued to keep searching. I could feel the ceiling giving in to my weight, which meant I had to find a different hiding spot. After a couple of minutes and making sure she was no longer nearby, I slowly descended back into the room being as quiet as I could. I peered my head into the hallway to see if anyone was there, but no one was in sight. I made my way through the hallway with the smallest steps I could make, flinching at every sound I heard. I figured I should hide on the first floor since she had already checked the entire floor already. Though I did not know exactly where she was, I figured she would be upstairs. I slowly made my way downstairs making sure no one was there. As I heard her shoes touching the floor of the floor above me, I knew I was safe to walk on the first floor for a while. This seemed to be a horrible conclusion because the moment I turned the corner, I could see the silhouette of a man standing near the ICU. I could see his face turn to me. I quickly jumped behind the wall hoping he had not seen me. What is a patient of mine doing out of his room so late? The man asked. Realizing I did not have long before he would be here, I had two options. My first option was to go back upstairs and hope I would not encounter the girl and maybe find a hiding spot there. The second option was to run to the bathroom once again in hopes I'd be safe there. I didn't like either of those options, as I felt either of them would lead to me getting caught. Though I did not feel like I had the time to go back upstairs at all, 
I quickly ran towards the bathroom. Right before I wanted to enter the bathroom, I noticed the janitor's closet right underneath the stairs. Feeling like it's my best chance of survival, I opened the door and hid myself behind a container and a pile of trash bags. Come on now, I need to inspect your organs. The man proclaimed as I heard him open the bathroom door. His voice sounded familiar, but at first I did not seem to understand why. That was until he finished searching the bathroom. You were smart enough to hide somewhere else this time. I'm impressed you are not as stupid as you look. He said as I realized who he was. The guy sounded exactly like the maniac I had encountered before. My blood froze at the fact that he knew where I was all along. He opened the janitor closet and looked around for a bit, but decided it was too small for someone to hide in. So he closed it soon after, leaving me in utter darkness, horrified to do anything. I stayed in there for the rest of the night, not getting out until I knew it was completely safe. I could hear a drill, followed by a man screaming in agony. The man, who I assumed was the surgeon, laughed maniacally. I grabbed my phone to see how long I had left until the nightmare was over. 5.45 a.m. Only 15 minutes left until the staff of the hospital would come in for their daily shift. I just had to hold on for a little bit longer. I ended up falling asleep in the closet, feeling completely hopeless and defeated, exhausted from the night I had witnessed. I was woken up by a kind old man who seemed to be the janitor, who seemed surprised to see a security guard hiding behind his equipment. Rough night? He asked, though he knew the answer based on my expression. It's over. You can come out now. I got back on my feet and walked back into the hallway. The hospital looks completely different during the day than it does at night. Instead of being unsettling, it seemed like a nice place. I thanked the janitor for his kindness and got the hell out of that place. I drove home and collapsed on my bed. I still could not comprehend what I had witnessed. It all felt like a fever dream. I told my boss I was sick and did not bother to answer his phone calls. After a week, I returned to my regular uneventful shifts. Though the boredom might be horrible, I do not mind it at all. In the end, anything is better than having to spend the night in that hospital.